this just happened. You've probably heard about the Voyager 1 probe. Why I put this up is, um, you know, it just left the solar system to explore the larger galaxy. And I was fascinated because I realized the Voyager and I, 1977, we both, this is when I came to the school here, and we both have been doing this journey for the last 36 years. It's about to go explore a much bigger galaxy, and I am doing the same thing. So I'm going to tell you about my journey. So for those of you that may or may not have seen The Social Network, um, I'm from LLA. I can talk about movies. Um, there's a few funny moments in the film. Um, this is one of my favorites. And luckily, just recently, um, Huffington Post, because Dakota Johnson is going to be playing uh, Anastasia character in Fifty Shades of Grey, the movie, um, there's a wonderful clip on Huffington Post. And you can um, look at that clip that actually shows this scene. And it's one of my favorite scenes in the movie. Basically, uh, she turns to him and says, what was your latest printer? And he describes something like, well, you know, it's a music file sharing thing. She goes, oh, like Napster? And he goes, no, Napster. And you'll see her reaction, so I won't give you the spoiler. Um, this whole idea of entrepreneurship is something that I find very <clears throat> interesting because I've kind of fallen into it. And then in other ways, I've lived it my entire career, as Vic alluded to. And I think one of the most interesting things I found recently was a definition by um, James Altucher. And I'm going to do this again. He's an author and an entrepreneur. Um, he's written some very interesting books. And you can love and hate him, too. But I thought his definition was very interesting. He says, entrepreneurship means finding the challenges you have in your life and determining creative ways to overcome those challenges. And if you think about it, the way people start businesses, and many of the ones I'm involved in, are things where we go, how do we solve this? Or this really makes me mad. And that's really where you should go with it, things that you're closest to. And I'll talk some more about some of the other reasons why you want to do that. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to first talk about the beginning of my career, where I really was an entrepreneur. And that was way before that term even existed. Now, the thing that I will tell you that's really funny, I was texting the word entrepreneur to somebody recently. And you get a certain distance into that text, and the word autocorrects to entrapment. I thought, what a metaphor. It is so true. You're in corporate America. You're trying to be an entrepreneur. So you're an entrepreneur. You're working. And all you can think about is, why am I here? It is entrapment. And so we're going to talk some more. You may decide that you know, the corporate life isn't for you. OK, let's start. Love to play with logos. And I thought, well, what better way to kind of give you a feel for my journey and my path on the corporate side? We'll start here. Um, you see an old Price Waterhouse logo up there. That's not, not their new one. They're Price Waterhouse Coopers now. There's been a lot of merging. Uh, when I started, uh, it was the big eight. And uh, so there were eight public accounting firms, all very, uh, uh, what's the word? Um, they all had different personas. And they all had different, uh, there was a pecking order. And you'll understand why I mentioned that in a minute. But I actually, uh, one of the libraries I worked at here in the university worked all over town. I worked at Natural Science Library. I worked at the Natural History Museum Library. I worked at Benzinger Library in East Quad. But my last gig on campus was with the Business School Library. And that's what got me the job at Pricewaterhouse. I actually got hired finals week. I um, had to actually go start work and come back to campus and take a final. Um, and I was hired to run their uh, research area. And at that time, it consisted of a library. And then you were doing audit, tax, and MIS research. And the other thing at that time was there were very few women on the professional side. You had a massive steno pool. You had uh, a few kind of uh, accounting assistants or audit assistants. Uh, there might have been one or two women accountants, but there were no women on the professional side. You basically, uh, it was assumed you were a secretary. And many times you were talked to that way. Uh, the, the thing about Price Waterhouse in Detroit was it went into the new Renaissance Center. So there we were. I was shown a library on the 29th floor of Tower 200 that had spectacular views. I had the biggest space I'd ever had. And um, away we went. The interesting thing about this is if you've been to the Renaissance Center, it, is, uh, it was in those days four towers and then the hotel in the center. And now I think it's seven towers. So let's do the math. Eight accounting firms, four towers. Two accounting firms in each tower. Guess what? Librarian at each accounting firm, two librarians in each tower. This is way before internet, web sharing, any of this stuff. We're collaborating in elevator lobbies over at lunch. A partner would say, can you get me blah dee blah And we'd go, hold on a minute. And we would call our network. We had our own network within that uh, complex. 
And we are constantly sharing information. And it is so different now when I think about it, I, I can't even picture what it would be like. Okay, jump then to the fact that I had a chance to go to California. And I was rather flippant about it. I told my uh, then husband at the time, I said, if you can get a job in California, I'll go. He had one in two weeks. So be careful sometimes when you're flipping about these things. Um, we moved to California. Uh, he was a CAD person. And oddly enough, uh, the CAD area was booming in Detroit and ahead of the aerospace industry, which is very odd. It normally isn't that way. Um, and so they were quite happy to get him. And I started looking for jobs. And um, I got this job at Hughes through a newspaper ad and through a newspaper ad where they said, we never put ads in that little local newspaper, but the guy that was running this new department wanted somebody that lived nearby. I got this job on Valentine's Day. I still remember this. And they were laughing. They go, we've never had anyone answer an ad from this paper. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk about that job in a minute because it's, uh, it's going to you're going to see why the path I ended up on. The next logo is the Hughes Electronics logo. What happened, the very first logo, why I put that up there, is um, that's the original Howard Hughes logo that existed when I joined the company. And Hughes was still part of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. The important part about that, it was a private company. Money flowed like water. No one ever asked, how much does it cost? Oh, is that in our budget? Never, never. And I was actually working for an 0101. That's the top policy guy reporting to um, the president of the company. If you said your source code on the phone to someone, I'll have it there this afternoon. Do I need to carry it? Would you like to come? You know, it was like hop two. Unbelievable time to be working in a company. And to have it really be your first job um, was mind blowing. Um, Hughes Electronics, they really started this thing where um, they realized they could take a lot of their technology and look at commercial applications. And Hughes had already started doing that. They were the first inventor of the um, digital watch. In fact, when I got there, they were handing digital watches out as um, marketing, uh, you know, tchotchkes and things. The, um, the other thing, you know, they have a long history of all this technology. Well, when I was there, I was there through this whole period where looking at how do you repurpose all of this long legacy of technology into commercial products. And I was involved in almost every one of those activities. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. So it was a really fascinating and heady time to be there. OK, so I'm there. And this guy decides to retire. And suddenly, they've built a massive new gorgeous headquarters into the side of the hill in Westchester. Uh, it's four football fields in length, giant atrium. We're all there. Um, well, then we hear that. Um, Hughes is going to sell the company. The Howard Hughes Medical Institute is going to sell the company. We're going to be a public company. People can't believe this is going to happen. And uh, rumors start, Boeing's going to buy us. Boeing's going to, you can, you know, and an atrium, everybody can hear. The FedEx guy would come in whistling in the morning. The entire building could hear him whistle and what he said to the receptionist. No one ever told him because it was a source of amusement, I guess. I don't know. The, um, the thing about this was we're waiting. We hear the announcement is going to be made. Um, the uh, CEO of the company gets on a loudspeaker. Imagine four atrium, four football fields in length, a four-story atrium, a loudspeaker. Worse than the airport, right? I'd like to let you know that the Hughes Aircraft Company has been bought by, and we're already going, Boeing, because everybody's thinking, hey, if it gets bad, I'll move to Seattle, right? Everybody's so excited. Going to go to Seattle. Leave LA, go to Seattle. The Hughes Aircraft Company has been bought by General Motors. Could have heard a pin drop. People are like, what? How did this happen? I'm sitting there going, whoa, the long arm reaches out. It was amazing to me. Well, we quickly found that the reason they wanted to do this is they had this interest in what could not only Hughes technology, but Hughes manufacturing processes do for General Motors. This became insane. We were funded. I was in a, um, a corporate mar market research facility. That's what I was doing. And we had set it up to be run exactly like uh, a market research firm that anybody would hire off the street. And at one point, they even talked about spinning us out because we were so successful. So we were doing these joint market research projects with um, General Motors and going all over the country. And I'm going to talk about some of the, the products that we worked on there. But the thing about this was I absolutely uh, found this fascinating because I knew the GM culture just from growing up in Detroit and certainly being around everybody that had worked at GM. And I would be in meetings, and somebody would say, 
we're going to need somebody to go to Detroit. And people would be looking around. <laughs> I'd go, you know, I could go. I could go. So they would send me. And um, the other thing is, I was, at that time, I was a junior executive, so I actually got to go to the uh, General Motors director training. Um, and so I've done the Hughes director training, the General Motors director training, and the Boeing director training. And let me tell you, sitting there hearing about GM directors, and especially their benefits and their salaries, I thought, oh, this is why <laughs> this is the way it is. And we'll talk about that offline. Okay, right below there is this Hughes after Howard book, which um, I have a copy of, I'll show you later. Great book, Ken Richardson, who was um, one of our presidents uh, during the time I was there, uh, wrote this great book, and uh, I encourage you to take a look at it, very fun. Um, well, so, he, you know, Hughes didn't get bought by Boeing in 1985, but guess what? A few years later, finalized in 2000, Boeing did buy us. Uh, interestingly enough, by that time, I was on a team that was doing all of the new ventures, and I was actually involved uh, with the initial kind of reach out to Boeing and those talks about synergy and where could we go. And I was actually on the team that looked at uh, how you could take these businesses, merge them with Boeing businesses, and you'd have this huge upside. Um, of course, later there was a lawsuit claiming that um, you know, there was way too much upside that they paid for. Uh, the reality of that, I turned to my boss, I go, you know what, we did our job. We did a great job. Think about it. Um, big logo here for Boeing Digital Cinema, and I'll talk more about that story in a, in a little bit. Uh, I worked on what was huge, Hughes Digital Cinema, and even before that, we had a Hughes uh, Digital Projector product. So I actually, more than 15 years working digital cinema, and we'll talk about that more. Uh, lovely logo, though, uh, great videos. Uh, eyes, you know, are the window to the soul, and just really a nice logo. Um, okay, so I realized in looking back that I actually was making all kinds of information products back in the day. So I thought, well, this might be kind of fun. So you see there, we're going to jump back to Pricewaterhouse for just a little bit. That was the kind of beast that we would be making copies on. This was a Xerox machine where you had, if you had a lot of um, uh, report processing, so you imagine an accounting firm, they're doing audits, they have to get these reports out to their clients, they have to look very professional, but this is before desktop pu publishing and any of that stuff. It's done with a steno pool and photocopies. Well, one of the things that they wanted every day, you'll see it up there, the Pricewaterhouse Detroit office daily news briefs. Talk about making yourself crazy because this is before cut and paste, download this, uh, run an alert, none of that exists, right? Um, you were actually going through uh, newspapers, magazine articles, you had a list of the 30 odd uh, clients of the firm and they wanted to know everything that happened about any one of them and appeared anywhere in any magazine or any newspaper and they wanted that compiled every day and they wanted it the next morning on their desk. And it was a massive cut and paste, literally cut and paste and tape photocopy job. And this thing ran 10 to 12 pages easily every day. You did that, you did that day in and day out. Plus you did all your other work. That just shows you how far this kind of information uh, sharing world has changed and how labor intensive it was. If you jump to the other side, this was what I was hired by Hughes in that Valentine's Day ad to do. They were setting up a brand new department to look at uh, international offset. And international offset is when you're doing a contract and you want to sell something to that particular country, and they say, yeah, 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 we want to buy it, Hughes, but you've got to put some skin in the game. You've got to put some uh, business into our country. You've got to subcontract or uh, take some product out of our country as part of that uh, contract. Well, Hughes at that time was seven different divisions run like major companies. They had 14,000, 12,000 employees. They had presidents. They easily were their own corporation unto themselves. Imagine that all under one umbrella. This was to stop people from sending teams in. So take seven teams and they're all going in to visit companies overseas. In some cases, little uh, wire harness companies, right? Who, who would be stuck, depending on the time of year, like if somebody wanted to go holiday shopping or somebody wanted their summer vacation, you had Hughes employees and their spouses visiting week after week after week. And 
the corporation said, hey, 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 we need to be smarter about this. We need to have a centralized product, and we need to be able to uh, vet these suppliers and put this in a database. Well, the guy they asked to do it, Jim Sullivan, nicknamed the gorilla I found out later, mainly because he had upended a huge mahogany desk in a meeting one time, um, had this vision. He wanted to start this sourcing system, and he wanted to do it based on a questionnaire, but not a questionnaire that you just sent, a questionnaire that he had a team of executives go into country and interview and walk through factories. And he went down to the minutia level, whether there was hot and cold running water in the employee restrooms, because to him, that was a sign of how you valued your employees. You didn't value them enough to have some hot water. Maybe you weren't the right supplier for Hughes. He was a longtime manufacturing guy. Um, he had a company that was bought by Sylvania, and then Hughes bought that company. He reported directly to the president and could do whatever the hell he wanted. He was about six foot two, came from uh, MIT, um, classic short sleeve shirt, pocket protector, buzz cut, um, but brilliant. You see that computer there? That's an IBM 3101 dumb terminal. When people talk about the cloud, I'm like, yeah, okay, we were in the cloud. Think about Hughes. What was the name? Hughes Aircraft Company? What was the name of our network? This blows my mind today. HackNet, H-A-C-N-E-T. This is the system I designed for HackNet. Okay, the offset sourcing system. These questionnaires would be done. We would take that data, uh, put it in this database. We were using Focus, a 4GL relational database, maybe the first or second year of its existence. Still around, by the way, has a web-based version. Still Jerry Cohen, still running the company. Even more amazing. We went to uh, you know, special user groups and uh, uh, conferences. This was you know, going to change the world, this, this database product. Um, I will tell you that this sourcing system, millions were spent on this because, again, no one ever asked, how much does it cost? We need this. And guess what? IBM 3101, there were no PCs or computers or laptops. It was a status symbol for executives to have one of these on their desk. So I had lots of people signing up for it. The top echelon of the company all had one of these, all had to be trained by me, per my boss, all had to be taught how to use a computer. So I go to my first training session. It's a pretty smart guy, PhD, big time executive, working in the space area. He goes, yeah, they delivered it last week. I don't know what to do. I can't get it to work. I'm like, OK, well, maybe we'll plug it in. <laughs> yes. Anyway, um, a lot of fun. OK, next I went to work for really what ended up being the most dynamic, amazing part of Hughes, HCI, Hughes Communication Sync. You don't see a lot about it now because they've actually stolen the name and repurposed it. You can't even find the old logo, which was so beautiful because it said, we make things happen. It was so true. This is where DirecTV started. This was where the first, the idea of um, selling uh, satellite services, so selling satellite time was invented. The guys that started this, brilliant, brilliant guys, and they were insatiable in terms of wanting information. So I created a dashboard. But think about this. This is 1995. There's none of this. Lotus Notes is just trying to you know, come up out of the soil. Uh, everything was a uh, subscription model. Uh, they knew that when they were coming to Hughes, they could really try to soak us with subscriptions. We put every single possible thing we could think of uh, out on this system. And look at that slogan, faster, smarter, cheaper, without ever leaving your desktop. But it was a desktop. It was a massive thing, big monitor. And we were a Mac shop. Uh, so really big monitors back then, um, but it was amazing. And the, uh, the interest in information, and we were doing market research all over the world. We, at one point, I had a team where we decided, well, wait a minute, we've got to figure out what's next. We literally spent six weeks, we took every single aspect of the telecommunications industry at that time, so that was probably 1996, there wasn't a single thing we didn't touch. At one point, we're in a meeting, and the CFO of the company says, well, why don't you just buy Starbucks? Everybody kind of looked at that. Hmm, well, think about that. What could we do with that? It was a time where there was no idea that wasn't worth thinking about. We were doing FCC filings. We were creating new businesses, and I'm going to talk about that. And that's really one of the things, when you have a satellite, anytime, anywhere, and it was our vision, our interest, and it was so personal for people. They would just say, I want to be able to do this. Okay, so we're going to jump back a little to the 90s, 
uh, in the very beginning, I'm still part of General Motors. I'm at corporate. And what are we working on? We're working on car things. Some of these have only just appeared. A lot of the stuff I work on, it tends to have a 15-year you know, gestation period. Look at this. Adaptive collision avoidance. Well, you've got that in a few cars now. But the thing we were talking about is going to be totally what driverless car. We had looked at keeping that interval between cars, right? And that would be another way of collision avoidance. And you wouldn't have to, what would you do? You'd just kind of lock onto the car in front of you, take your hands off the wheel. And of course, we would be Googling. OK, automatic tire pressure management, invented by a guy at our research labs who loved to race motorcycles. All he could think about was, if I had tire pressure management motorcycle, two wheels, if your tire goes out on a motorcycle, much bigger problem than when it goes out on a car. We went all over the country. I have done focus groups with Harley owners. I have done focus groups with um, the Honda Goldwing owners. Um, just imagine uh, asking them to wrap their brain around the idea that something on their little dash would tell them what was going on with their tire. Um, Compact fluorescent light bulbs, that was a trip. Those research labs guys, they were so excited to work on something that was uh, for commercial use, they invented this light bulb. They were so excited. I set up, in true market research fashion, I set up an entire store, a fake store, and I got all those corporate employees to walk through the fake store and look at the packaging for the new Hughes light bulb. But I put real compact fluorescent light bulbs all around those light bulbs. So here's my team, my little research team, all those PhDs coming in. They go, where'd you get those? Well, I went to the grocery store and I got some. They go, you can't buy compact fluorescent light bulbs. You have to get them in specialty catalogs. That's why we invented this one. I said, no, you can buy as many of them as you really need to find at this point. It was this ivory tower. They just had not looked recently. It had been a year or two. The market's moving. Uh, digital dental records and dental chair. We were doing missile guidance. The person that um, invented this was a dental hygienist on the weekend. She knew that this could be used for this. She also ended up inventing a system for mammograms. She left the company. She's doing very well. She saw a parallel and was able to take it to the next spot. Uh, I told you about doing uh, direct TV. We were, uh, we were doing direct TV Asia. We were doing market research in both Hong Kong and in mainland China. Um, and this was right as the transition was happening, um, made for some very interesting moments. I had a researcher call me and go, um, I'm at City Hall in this whatever town he was in, and they won't let me out. They want to know why I'm here. <laughs> he said, you know what, come home. Uh, environmental re remediation. At one point, uh, there was a guy that had invented a variation on that orange cleaner that's everywhere. He, he took off and went off to do that. We were testing whether we should be burning dirt. Well, I can still remember those focus groups. Environmental lawyers, that's who you want to talk to. They go, don't do it. Right to the camera. We're like, okay, we got gotcha. you. Uh, heads up displays for cop cars, a lot of that. Here's that JVC projector that then ended up uh, being kind of a legacy for uh, our digital cinema. Hybrid networks are satellite and terrestrial. Uh, here's the fun we had, iCar, iTruck, and iTrain. We don't own those names, but all we did is we looked at, okay, if you had internet and every fantasy into the car, what would you do with it? And we worked jointly with this, with OnStar, and we basically designed next generation OnStar. I'm only starting to see a few of those things happening. I mean, this is 15 years ago, practically, guys. Um, iTruck, we were hot to buy one of these trucking uh, company, tracking companies and go kind of to the next, uh, with the next generation, and only now, Omnitrax, uh, owned by Qualcomm, it's, it's for sale after all these years. Uh, iTrain, there was a lot of interest in being able to do things, have Wi-Fi on trains. Some of that exists now, some of that still, you still see uh, RFPs for that. In-flight entertainment, we bought an in-flight entertainment company. And we were going to go into that a big way because we were going to put the projectors on the planes. We did. We put a lot of projectors on planes. Some of those planes, sometimes I get on a plane, that projector is still there. I, I, I just can't even imagine. Um, the owner of that company wanted to expand and do commercial sales. He wanted to change uh, in-flight, the whole duty-free. He wanted that all automated. He had this great idea, except he was completely fixated with blue blocker sunglasses from Costco. And he thought that should be the only product that we sold. It was lightweight, and he was pretty insistent. We had to spend a lot of time going, you know, you're going to reach market saturation at some point, and, you know, there might be something else you're going to want to do. Uh, intelligent vehicle highway systems, 
we're only starting to see uh, more and more of that, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Maglev trains, uh, they were trying to get into that in a big way, um, decided not to do that. Spaceway is what's now HughesNet, the two-way uh, satellite uh, service from Hughes, uh, which is now Hughes Network Services. Uh, and telemedicine, I'm now working telemedicine systems again, so that was the 90s. 2000, only, this is only about five, six years worth of stuff. Digital cinema and digital signage, we thought we could really expand there. Well, then what happens? We're owned by Boeing. <clears throat> we survived the dot-com bust, right? We're still going, great guns, nobody's, everybody's, you know, we're okay. What happens? 9-11. Boeing, two planes into the towers. These are Boeing planes. Are people traveling for business? No, because there's no travel. It was insanity. The entire company just, I mean, it was almost like people didn't know what to do. Well, then we started getting the phone calls. You've got to help us. You've got to do Homeland Security. You've got to help us. The, um, the company decided that digital cinema was not their core business, and they were going to sell off the assets, but not the people. So we had this amazing team, the most cutting-edge team in the whole company. And they sell off our company. And at first, we're like, we're going. We're going to go do digital cinema. We're the leaders. We're amazing. They said, no. We're going to start Homeland Security, and all of you are going to go start that business for us. And that's what we did. Now, can you imagine? One day, you're working digital cinema. You're working with movie studios. You're, you're going all over. And the next day, you're being told that you are going to work on airport security cargo security. Um, the team that did the airport security, that was the baggage screening, and don't yell at me, had nothing to do with that part of it. Um, and I will tell you, the thing that drove that was they wanted it in place in six months. And there were people, I mean, I'm sure there were bookies in Las Vegas taking odds against us that we would never get this done. Um, we got it done in six months. The government was shocked. They, they, it was amazing. Well, I was part of the team that was working the next issue, which was, okay, how do you keep cargo secure, especially um, ship-based cargo? Really a lot of uh, concern and paranoia about that. And the, um, the thing about it was, you forget this, that Department of Homeland Security was 22 agencies brought together. The government was starting that while we were starting us. And nobody knew what anybody was doing. And everyone was trying to come up with solutions and do something and requests for proposals were coming out. Well, this is a new department, and they, I'm talking about the government department, they were putting out proposals with 30-day deadlines. Good old Boeing was used to proposals, RFPs, where you might have four months, six months, huge teams off in rooms. This was mount a major proposal effort and get it done in, in 30 days or less. Um, we just started doing them. We didn't know any better. And we had been on the commercial side, so we were used to, you know, two-week proposals. We were, uh, we just started doing them. Well, some of the ones we did, end-to-end -end cargo security, hybrid networks, uh, mobile disaster recovery vehicles, because FEMA ended up, right, in Department of Homeland Security. We came up with a, a satellite-based uh, vehicle that could immediately set up a, uh, a disaster recovery communication system right there, wherever you were. Um, and then we got heavily into information sharing. The, a lot of the proposals we saw were so quickly written that we saw lots of situations where there would be a paragraph contradicting another paragraph. It was, they were almost impossible to answer in some ways. Um, but we persevered. Um, it reached a point where um, we then had a food fight between um, the defense side and Homeland Security, imagine this, both within the company and also perhaps going on in the government. And that was when Boeing decided that maybe they weren't going to be outwardly facing about Homeland Security, that maybe they would go back into a research mode and respond to things, but not have a, a business development effort. And so uh, they offered to put us in different places around the company, uh, or I was actually offered a golden handshake. And guess what, guys? I took it. Some of my colleagues did not take it. Guess what? They got one more year. I, I left. And I have never looked back. I'm going to talk about um, some of the startups I'm working with. Um, and uh, these are kind of fun. The uh, digital cinema folks, we started up again. 
Um, we had another company. This uh, Photonica is the company that's come out of that. And um, this is a display uh, company. They're uh, working on large displays, also flexible, uh, foldable displays. Um, it's really based on uh, magneto optics and uh, magneto photonics. Um, you can go to the website. It's photonicainc.com, or you can Google it. Um, Calavan is a satellite communications company, and it's with a bunch of satellite folks I used to work with um, in the HCI days. And uh, the difference, they have taken their ideas from back in the late 90s, and they've updated them. And we are uh, doing patents and going after RFPs, uh, going after um, SBIR grants, which I'll talk about. And uh, really, really wonderful stuff going on there. Very happy. The little logo down at the bottom is kind of interesting. Uh, here's Serendipity again. Um, this is uh, a company that has Dr. Arthur Tilford in it. And Dr. Arthur Tilford is the inventor of the two-way salad dish. But I didn't go out looking for Dr. Arthur Tilford. My friend called me and said, hey, I've got this company, and I've been working on this project. And the guy used to work at Hughes. I said, oh, well, maybe I know him. Well, of course, I knew him, but I never worked with him. Uh, we've just gotten our patent for a solar photon filter. You can look at the new Google patent search and find it. Um, it's a very cool thing. Uh, we're really excited about that. And um, one of the first industries for us with that is really um, agriculture. And uh, very cool. Uh, Team 50 is a company started by a Vietnam vet who had an idea um, for disaster recovery services and uh, some hardware and has a really unique idea. Um, and Team 50 was a team, a multi-country uh, team that was a name used in the Vietnam War. Uh, and there's a really interesting story there. Uh, and I'm, that group, that's the group that we've been doing the um, mobile mental health stuff and the PTSD stuff with USC, the uh, Institute for Creative Technologies using virtual humans. Um, you can go to ict.usc.edu and look at the stuff they do. They have a SIM coach. Um, we've been able to respond to some NIH SBARs and some Army ones, and we're, we just got word there's another one we're going to go after. So, um, you know, there's lots of things to find on grants.gov. It's really a, a kind of an exciting place to search and see. You might have some things that you've been thinking about. The top company is... Um, my bean jar, mybeanjar.com. And this is a, a rewardware company. Um, they give you real stuff. So when you're in a game and you uh, have a winning moment, it'll pop up and tell you you won a free pastry or you got a pair of socks at the Gap or not, you know, 10% off. It's a real thing. So uh, it's very fun. It's got a mobile wallet part of it. It's uh, really a... Uh, a great company. The legacy of the founders uh, is first rate. They really understand uh, what was needed, and uh, we're just, we're literally, I've, this week we've been raising money in New York, um, and, uh, you know, just keep your fingers crossed. Uh, sign up for it. Play it. It's only on iOS right now, but we expect to have the Android version very soon, probably in another couple weeks. Um, and then I'm working with a brain researcher, uh, and I'll show that to people later uh, at the reception if you want to see it. He's uh, just trademarked alph alphabetical brain vocabulary, and he's done this amazing uh, way of learning about the brain and kind of retraining your brain. So it's pretty cool. Um, and we'll probably be doing some pilot tests of his website and his product. Uh, I have to say I convinced him that the way to go was mobile and tablet, and that was a year and a half ago, and he fought me, and now he believes me, so it's good. Um, okay, you know, you've heard me talk about this. This is my pet peeve, broadband networks. We, we need bandwidth, we need ubiquity. Satellites give you inf instant infrastructure, wireless to a certain extent. And this whole idea of knowing now, you know, this came about because we were at a dinner party and we were arguing about some point, and one of the kids, you know, the college students, turned to us and said, it's not like you don't have something in your pocket where you can know now. We're like, oh, yeah. Everybody pulled out their phone. <laughs> it was a contest to look it up. You know, this is what's going to drive this. Okay. This is from The Graduate. My sister, says, my sister says I should have some.
guys come up here and role play this, but I don't know how our time is. Maybe we'll this. This is this old scene. If you haven't seen this movie, 1967. So Ben is a, a, is a new graduate, and Mr. McGuire is a neighbor. And he says, hey, you know, Ben, Mr. McGuire, I just wanted to say one word to you, just one word. Benjamin says, yes, sir. McGuire, are you listening? Yes, I am. Plastics. Exactly how do you mean, says Benjamin. Well, I like this because if I was doing this now, I would say to you, optics. And then I might say photonics. This is where the world is going. This is the plastics of the 1967. In fact, Walter Brooks, who played that role of Mr. McGuire, said if he would have known that plastics, the plastic industry was revitalized by that line in that movie. If he would have known that plastics was going to be what it was back then, he would have invested, but he didn't. So you're at this meeting today. I'm saying optics to you. I'm saying photonics to you. Um, I'm saying telematics to you. Um, there's been a lot of action going on in telematics. You're in the right place in the world to be looking at telematics. The thing about this, you saw that we worked on Next Generation OnStar. We're only starting to see some of those things. There were so many things we joked about. It's cars just another note on a network. FedEx could do the delivery to your refrigerated portion of your trunk while you're at work. Just think about what you can do when these things are connected, when you can release a lock on a trunk. Anything could be delivered to your trunk. This is the Amazon idea of the lockers. Well, why can't your car trunk be the locker? There are so many things. This uh, connected car research facility is opening up in Willow Run, right in your backyard. Um, and another link that I'll give you guys is there's just been a great um, transportation uh, symposium held up in Silicon Valley, and a lot of the folks were there. They were talking about looking at the whole transportation industry and the whole information layer, and now you have you know, this joke about smart is the new green. This is all about, if you put this smart layer uh, onto transportation, what happens? And these are things that I worked on 10, 15, 20 years ago. Some of the technology is only catching up, and now we can do them. All right, let's talk a little bit about, I love infographics. Here's another job. You want to start making infographics, you got a graphic side to you. Everything is being done as an infographic. Or how do you make infographics easier to display, read, pull out? I'm giving you business ideas here. OK, this is a recent survey. Um, it was, is there an entrepreneurial mindset? Is entrepreneurship really a mindset? 90% of people think it is. 72% uh, want to quit to be entirely independent. No surprise there. 61% say they're likely to quit within two years. So I don't know. Um, top reason to quit, freedom. To work wherever, whenever. What is that? Anytime, anywhere, guys. What are we saying? Same thing. OK, look at this one. I love this. This is from a uh, business uh, planning entrepreneurship center in Costa Rica with a couple of professors from the University of Michigan are there, I noticed. Look at this place. This is the place to go, especially if you want to do social entrepreneurship. This is, this is their business plan. Little image there, I love it. It sums it up, right? OK, you got your, you got your question. What are you going to solve? What global problem are you guys going to solve here at UMSI? So you have your idea. OK, go to the right along the top. If it works, good. That means you get money, right, down there? If it doesn't work, what do you do? Feedback, go back, start over, another idea, right? OK, back to James Altucher, the guy that has written these books and just posted. He just posted. Another thing to Google. He just posted his 100 Rules for Entrepreneurs. I had a lot of fun reading it. I encourage you to read it. You'll agree with most of it. Uh, some of it will surprise you. Some of it he's probably got an agenda because of his next book. But yeah, when he got asked this question, I want to start a business but don't know what my passion is, he told the guy to read his first book. So at least he knows he can. But, but think about that question. This makes me think about. What does that mean? I want to be an entrepreneur, but I don't know what I want to work on? You've got to follow what you want to do, because so much of what an entrepreneur does, it, you live and breathe it. I tell you, it's curiosity, it's inspiration, serendipity. Um, it's a mindset. I agree. I mean, I have to agree. OK, part of my passion, libraries. That top building, when I moved to Cal um, California, and I moved to Redondo Beach, right there on the ocean. 
south of LAX, that top building was our library. 1930, it was on the historic register, and it had a dirt floor where the books were stored, underneath on the right side there. And I got asked to apply for the library commission. I hadn't lived in the city six months. And they said, no, you have to. Well, I went and interviewed. I was the youngest commissioner in the city. I was the shortest uh, residency in a city to be appointed to a commission. And I got asked, would you start a Friends of the Library group? And I'm fresh-faced. I'm from Michigan. I go, why, yes, not knowing what had been happening for all those years and why they didn't have one. But I prevailed. I started a Friends of the Library group 30 years ago. I'm still working with many of the same volunteers. So if you don't volunteer, please volunteer. You have to volunteer. I'm working with people I worked with 30 years ago, and I remember thinking, oh, those people are old. That was 30 years ago. <laughs> I'm old. Now they're really old. But it's a wonderful group, and it's been my passion. And look at these two bottom buildings. We built this new library, and we completely redid this one on the right as a branch. That's the first lead building in our city. Um, and this, this library here, the main library, is such a showcase. It's at our city hall area, our civic center area. It is a beautiful building. It got the largest state library uh, building grant ever awarded. This north branch, the largest amount of money raised by citizens ever in the city towards a, a public building effort. These are the legacy, and we have to look at, okay, what happens next? You look at maker spaces and 3D printing and more community events. What happens in libraries going forward? We're in the middle of a huge strategic planning effort looking at what is the future of our libraries. And it was um, our library director. We've had only three library directors in 30 years, and our most recent library director retired, and we're looking for a new library director. Anybody with six years' experience, come see me. Lovely, lovely job. Okay. I'm going to talk a little bit about nuts and bolts on entrepreneurship stuff. Tons of funding issues and things going on. You're all familiar with this. Friends and family, you're going to do a round for me. Angels, private equity, venture capitalists are VCs. This is another area. Do not um, think that you can't go after a government grant. You totally can. And it's grants.gov. Um, and it's got a wonderful search engine. And sometimes I just search it. I'm always surprised at what I find. And it might not have, I might search a term that I read about and think, I wonder if the government's doing anything. I am always surprised. The other big area that people tend to ignore, or they're the big ones, like the Gates Foundation, which has very specific, I've done two of those, very specific requirements, very hard to qualify for. But there are so many other private foundations, and there are great um, directories and great centers that actually help you get those private um, foundations. I'd encourage you to take a grant writing class, either online or one of the classes, I'm sure they teach it in Ann Arbor. Um, I couldn't encourage you to do that. It's a wonderful way to get into companies, to help companies, to do private consulting. Uh, it's a great transition. It's something you can do as a student. Um, so I really encourage you to look at grant writing, both for your own company and for others. Um, and then this, we've been waiting over a year since they announced it was going to be, we're taking that crowdfunding model from Kickstarter and Indiegogo we're now going to allow equity-based crowdfunding. Took the SEC a year to figure this out. Finally, September 23rd, guys, you are going to be able to post and do a crowdfunding pitch for your small company and do shares. Okay? There are some portals. That's going to be the way to go that are literally helping you do that and are uh, authorized, have the uh, broker license, et cetera. Uh, this is a great story. You can see that it's been a year. Uh, Mohana posted this a year ago because everybody was excited, thought we were going to be doing these in a few weeks. It's been a year. But this is what you want. Clear story. Don't assume expertise. I am shocked. I go into meetings sometimes, and I think, you know, I'm talking to some fancy uh, hedge fund owner or um, a VC, and I think, oh, they must know all about my field because why would they want to talk to me? And they say, tell me about this. I don't know anything about it. So never assume. Write it as though they have no expertise. Choose your audience. With these um, new uh, 
crowdfunding portals, you'll be able to pick the one that looks best for you. There's already one for healthcare. They're propping up in all the industries. So Health Funder, for instance, is the one for healthcare. Um, you want to show the investor what you already have, what you've been working on. And um, you want to be really careful about uh, you know, who invests in your company. So you just want to be careful. And um, you know, it's paying attention. OK, uh, I don't have to remind you. Intellectual property, this is the gold standard. This is stuff that goes straight to your bottom line. As a new company, you don't have a lot of sales. Where's your revenue? It's not that. You've got whatever your idea is, be it a service, be it uh, an actual product. Patent it, trademark it, and this is hard. You know, these things cost money. Get to know patent attorney. This is a patent guy I use up in Northern California, Mike Woods. He want, he, um, this all things patent, patent he does as a, uh, a blog, and it's lovely. He completely tracks what's going on in patents. Just following that helps you stay uh, in touch with what's going on. This is money in the bank to you, though, for your company. This is, uh, even if it's just an idea where you've got a special logo, trademark that. Copyrights are the cheapest. They're only about 30 bucks. Trademarks are going to run you $300 uh, for the filing and then you know, probably cost you about $1,200 or $1,500 total. Patents, of course, are expensive. But you've got to start the process, and you've got to be ready. And um, I can't tell you, this, the companies that I talked about that I'm part of and I work with, this is key to our success. Advisors, you want advisors. You want to create an advisory board. You know, in the early days of your company, you don't have a lot of money. You can't really pay somebody to be an advisor, but appeal to their ego. Tell them about this advisory board. Tell them about this great title they're going to have on your advisory board. Tell them how they're going to meet other great people on the advisory board, how they're going to know early on about a product that nobody else really knows about. Um, and certain advisors will stay with you and some will leave. They won't, you know, it just depends. Um, and always, always. Be honest with yourself. When you don't know something, you know, if only we knew what we don't know, that's where you want to be. You want to understand what you don't know. And don't be afraid to tell people that you don't know. OK, this, I uh, told Vic, people have said this to me. They're, they're, they have founded a business. They're going great guns. They're trying to raise money. And they get asked for a financial forecast. And they go, no, 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 it's just a bunch of wags, which is wild ass guesses. It's useless, not my thing. Trust me, this is where you have to pay attention. You can't be afraid to ask. There's wonderful uh, Excel videos. Just if you haven't learned Excel or you've been fighting it, just tell yourself, I'm going to watch one YouTube video a week about an Excel thing. There's an email I put on the list. She sends the most amazing things. I mean, this program has evolved from you know, what it was to just an amazing tool. And then. You have to force yourself to pay attention to the financial details. This is your company, your business. This is going to be how you do things going forward. You can't just say, oh, I can't, I can't deal with it. You have to deal with it. And you'll find out once you get into it, it actually gets kind of exciting because it shows you your roadmap, where you're going to make money, how quickly you're going to make money, what you have to worry about. Did you bring too many people on too fast? Oh my goodness, we've got too much rent. We've got to take that down. Here again, just start. If you've got an idea, just start. Look at, for the college students in the audience, look at that amount of discretionary spending power, 117 billion. Go back to the entrepreneurship definition, a problem that you were trying to solve in your own life. You're a college student. Solve that problem in your own life. Create your business. This is happening everywhere. I go to these meetings all the time in LA where they allow um, students to pitch their ideas. You know, people are just doing it. Um, Lots of public-private entrepreneurship programs. Ann Arbor's a hotbed of them. Detroit's amazing. I'm following a lot of the Detroit ones because one of my companies is here. And the, uh, the amount of opportunity that's being put together by states, by regions, by multi-states, there are these public-private, uh, they're tax write-offs, they're all kinds of things. And every state wants one, every state has one. Um, so wherever you want to be. OK, just a few infographics. This is showing what's happening with what types of business. This is a brand new study that's out. Look what's failing. Non-chain restaurants, direct sale, independent retail store. Not saying that you can't do that kind of business, but that's not the place to be probably. Growth rate, mobile games, 173%. Internet publishing, 110%. Residential construction. I've been in all of these. I'm still in some of these. These are going. You're in the sweet spot here at the School of Information. Between mobile games and internet publishing, you know, think about it. Here's uh, a nice infographic about mobile, and you've got the link there. You can go and find it. 
Uh, consumers, they love smartphones and tablets. You know that. You love your smartphone and tablet. You're worried about security and privacy. You know that. So what are businesses, what can you do? Solve your own problem. And look at mobile usage and advertising. We're seeing this with my bean jar. It's unbelievable. Um, big data. Everybody's talking about big data. What does this drill, you know, drill down to? It's volume, variety, and velocity. Not a lot more than that. I mean, you're going to hear a lot of hype. I see, I, I laugh. I see big data articles about just about everything. Um, the... Um, you know, the most interesting thing here is that the size of this digital universe is just growing. Um, and anything that helps people cut through this. And you are getting, for the UMSI students, you're in the hotbed of this. You're getting the kind of skills and degree that people want. InfoShare, these are some of my resources. They're on the back table there. Happy to talk about any of them at the, in, in the reception. These are, these are just some of the ones I um, have that I watch daily. Um, really encourage the Fierce Markets, amazing. They cover about, I don't know how many industries. Mashable, if you're not really Mashable. Every conference I've ever gone to and somebody gets asked, what do you follow in the tech industry? Mashable and TechCrunch. Guys, just, I have it fed into my Facebook. It's easy. It's fun. Mem um, Meme Burn is actually from uh, South Africa, one of the uh, most amazing trackings of what's going on. Uh, there's another one I follow from Australia. Science Daily, you can pick. So if you've got any interest in any type, there's ones just for brains. So I get all the brain research every day out of academia. It's amazing. This helps you see what people are doing. It gives you ideas. Economy. They are geographic, so you can sign up for X Economy Boston, Detroit, Texas, LA, Northern California. Start to read some of these on a daily basis. Moby Health News following mobile health. Every day, something amazing. This helps you think of your new idea. Hey, wait a minute, they're doing that differently. I could do something better than that. Okay, now. I put this in because it made Vic crazy. He's like, what's she going to talk about? Groupon India crashes amidst onion consumer frenzy. Well, I'm working with a rewardware company. We're talking about Groupon. And this popped up, and we're like, whoa, think about this. This is a situation where onions are like caviar in India. The price on Groupon was the lowest it had been in 30 years. But I started thinking about this. How could you do this kind of group on in Ann Arbor? Organic vegetables. What would you do with this? So many different suppliers have this. Or you did it at farmer's market. You know, you guys are going to India, those of you that are going to commit. Um, this is an issue and a problem. And you think about, well, we always think of Groupon as chiropractors and, you know, uh, wine tastings. What if you were trying to get vegetables or something out to the general public? Is there an organic vegetable business idea here? Anyway, I like the picture too. Thank you. And here, one of my favorite t-shirts, brand new on Think Geek. I'm going to read it. There are two kinds of people in the world, those who can extrapolate from incomplete data. <laughs> oh, good, you laughed. They, even on the site, they have a time. How long you laugh determines what kind of person you are. I'm in the right room. Thank you.